Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for tuning in to this morning's panel session. Now, what a year it has been. It's been a year where you could turn on the TV at any stage during the week and watch a footy game. It's been a year where it's been somewhat acceptable to wear moccasins, tracksuit pants, and a shirt and tie all at once. It's also been a year where the Australian nature that we have has really had the opportunity to use our abbreviations and change coronavirus into the Rona. But that's not what we're here to talk about today. No, we're here to talk about online learning of mathematics during the coronavirus and what it is that we've learnt as a panel. Before I introduce my delegates that are next, uh, sorry, not my delegates, the panel members that are next to me right now, I'd like to go through just a few housekeeping things. The first one is if you have any issues, technical issues or anything along those lines, please go to the confirmation email that was sent to you at the beginning of, or in the lead up to this presentation today. You will see that there's some troubleshooting things that can help you through it, but also there's a contact number that you can go to and call up if you have any troubles. The other thing is my name is Thomas Moore. I will be the moderator for today's panel. And as part of that, if you could just write any questions or anything you have like along those lines, you'll see that oh, with that, let me just quickly get the right one here. We'll, you'll see that on your screen here at the moment, there is a picture. With, with writing in the questions, you'll see that at the top, there's a chat. That's just for things like uh, putting any comments about the presentation or anything along those lines. But if you do have questions for any of us today, please click on the ask a question button because that will make it a lot easier for me to go back and find them and be able to ask them towards the end of the presentation. The other thing is that I would like to thank this, I'll take this opportunity to thank Jack Aranda for sponsoring the, today's keynote as well. So in saying that, let us make a start and I'll introduce our lovely panel members here today. So we have, first of all, to my left, Michael Schaffner. Now, Michael is in his second year of teaching, but I tell you what, speaking to him over the last few weeks, you wouldn't know that. It feels like he's been teaching for years. He's teaching at Panola Catholic College and he started out teaching last year over in Singapore and has recently obviously moved to Australia to teach here and take on what you'd think was a regular teaching gig, but obviously coronavirus has put a spanner in the works there. Now, Michael is a big fan of Angela Duckworth's work, in particular, The Power of Perseverance, and also Anne Rubenstein and the Rites of Passage Institute and the work that they put together as well. Michael's a uh, he's a Gen Z, as you can probably tell, he's a bit younger looking than myself. And he felt that this has really helped him in terms of putting all the learning together and, and, and putting it online and helping his students throughout the year. And he's really passionate about engaging students in mathematics using technology, but also helping them to become lifelong learners. Our next panel member is Lisa Haranis. Now, Lisa is the head of mathematics at, uh, at um, sorry, over Newton College. I did blank on that for a second. So Lisa is the head of mathematics at Over Newton Secondary College um, out in Keylor. She has been doing that for the last few years. And before that was the head of teaching and learning at the year nine campus as well. Now, part of uh, that role was actually helping develop ICT programs and things like that to help support the students. So as you can imagine, those skills and what she's gone through in the last few years um, has really helped with the whole pandemic and teaching online as well. Uh, and then over as the last person, we've got Nick Hildebrandt. Now, Nick is at Trinity Grammar in Kew. He's been teaching for four years. He taught at a couple of schools out in the UK at a couple of academies, um, both in Cambridge and in London. Uh, Nick is, he, before he did that, he actually studied law and commerce and actually um, went into insurance and finance before actually becoming a teacher. So he's got him a bit of a background that, that he's no doubt brought some of those skills into, into teaching online as well. So, so those are my lovely panel members to the left of me. Uh, and, and my name is, as I said, Thomas Moore. Now I am doing a PhD in mathematics. And I'm really interested in how teachers build or math teachers in particular, build strong relationships with their students so that they become more motivated and want to learn maths. And that's partly what brings me here today. I also have my own ed education consulting company in which I work with schools from around Victoria and, and other states as well to help improve the way in which mathematics is taught at the school. And I actually do a whole lot of resources and online things uh, through engagement in mathematics as well that you can find too. But the real thing that brings me here today is the fact that I actually do a bit of CRT on the side as well when I'm not doing all of those things. And as such, it got to the first remote learning period and we we're halfway through it and a school reached out to me and said, Tom, we'd like you to take on these two classes. Can you help? So I had to go through and build relationships with students who I'd never met before 
all online. So in saying that, we're going to go through and do the presentation now, and I'll start off by doing mine, and then we'll move through each one of the our lovely panel members here as well today, and we'll go from there. So in saying that, let's now make a start. So as I mentioned, back uh, in the very beginning of the first coronavirus lockdown period, I was asked if I'd like to take on two classes. Now, I was given a bit of a license to thrill, pedagogically speaking, of course, where I was, they said to me, uh, it doesn't matter, you know, what you really teach them, the, the number one thing that, that we care about is the student welfare and well-being. So that needs to be number one priority. And if you can teach them something on top of that, Tom, that would be brilliant. So, of course, I, I took up the opportunity because I was really excited because I've been doing a whole lot of stuff, as I mentioned before, around looking at teachers and how they build relationships with students. And I wanted to know, is it possible to transfer what I had learnt in the online, in the, in the regular setting into the online platform? And the other question was, is, you know, I was one of those annoying education consultants where I was putting up videos saying, this is how we should be treating lockdown and, and doing this and, and trying new things. But at the same time, I didn't really have too much credibility So, really, in terms of saying that because I wasn't in the classroom. So I really wanted to go in and see what it was like and note, make sure that the things that I was talking about worked. And I wanted to transfer those pedagogical practices from being in person to online. So how did I go about it? Well, I met my students online and, and I took, took three sort of principles into it. The first one was the students, it didn't matter what they did, I, as long as they were having a crack. And that was one of the first principles that we brought up. The next one was uh, that they need to share their thinking. So, it, you know, having a crack and sharing their thinking. So they didn't need to write down a whole lot of stuff, but as long as they were contributing into the chat and all those kinds of things, that was um, key. And the other principle I took into it was about not like math time was for math. So they weren't going away with lots of homework, as long as they were working for the time that they were in the class, and that's what was important to me. So, what did that look like? Well, I started off by asking the students a few questions about themselves and getting them to use an app called Or App, which is a collaborative online whiteboard, and they just put in all these answers in respect to a few questions. I then used those answers to fill out a spreadsheet and keep track of the information that they've given me about themselves. Now, I use this at the beginning of each lesson to just ask the kids a little bit about themselves. Remember, I'd never met them before. So I would just ask them, you know, how is, well, you know, how is the bike riding? Did you go out on a ride today? Or what, what are you watching on Netflix at the moment? Or, you know, those types of things, but using those things that they've mentioned as well. In terms of the, the types of lessons that I ran, well, you can see here, here's an actual example of an activity, one of my favorite ones in terms of how we explore, how many ways can you make up a hopscotch? And it actually leads into a nice open-ended kind of exploration that takes you to the Fibonacci sequence. And so they explored that in groups as well. And so that's one of the things. And then another one here is you can see an open-ended question in respect to, here's an area, what might the perimeter be? And you can see the different responses from students. They didn't need to write much, but they did need to show their thinking and share that with others. So. I'll talk now about that's a bit about what I did, but I then went and surveyed students after we went through and did this um, as a class. So just to go through this a little bit, they I surveyed the two classes that I had, and I had about a 76% um, response rate. So that was quite good to see so many students reply. The questions I asked them, a couple of questions. So what did you like about remote learning? And the first thing or the number one thing that students came back with was um, that they said that they liked being able to work from bed or from, from the kitchen, wherever it was comfortable for them. The other thing that they said that they quite liked was the flexibility in when they could work. They didn't have to stick to those school hours. They could, you know, do a bit of work at, um, throughout the day and then maybe a bit at night as well. The things that they disliked were the lack of social connection with their friends. They missed their friends. And also the amount of work. Students really felt under the pump with the work. So in respect to their favorite subject and why, so I asked them, okay, well, what's your favorite subject? We had 27% of students say PE was their favorite subject. But they, what was interesting around that was, they said it was because they didn't have to do much work. So I, I thought that was quite interesting. The next one was maths, which I was quite happy to see because I, I didn't expect maths to be something so high up, especially when I really hadn't got to meet the kids. When asked about why was it their, their favourite in terms of you know, how many students responded, these students mentioned the teacher, which I was quite flattened, flattered to hear, obviously. But in respect to my enthusiasm and, and helping the students and really making sure that they knew that I wanted them to learn whilst they were there, which, which was what I was hoping for. 
And then the other subjects that, that came through as well as being quite popular, as you can see, humanities, English and science. And the, the feedback that they gave once again around that was, was the kind of topics that they were learning about and also um, the subjects. And they felt quite confident in what they were doing, which I thought was really good because what it showed to me was the majority of students were actually wanting to learn when, when looking at those things. Um, you know, some students said, oh, you know, you didn't have to do much work. But the majority of students really were wanting to learn um, during remote learning. So I thought that was fascinating. Points of interest. Well, I asked students, um, what did you like most about learning mathematics during remote learning? And, and that you can see what, what they came up with here at the moment. So the fact that I asked about their lives. So obviously what I went through and did where I collected that information and I used that time to ask them about themselves really made a difference to those students. As well, where there was a focus once again on, on making sure they understood before we moved on. And the, and the students really appreciated that. In respect to what they didn't like, well, students said that they didn't like being kept in for, for the duration of an hour. So most classes at the school that I was working at, or working with, they actually only spent 15 to 20 minutes online, whereas I asked the students to stay online the whole time. And they said that they didn't like doing that. So I certainly take that away from there. Another student also said that he, did, or, he or she didn't feel challenged, which for me really um, shook, shook me because I didn't know that that was the case. So therefore, there's some obviously some challenges in that, which I would need to go through and address again if I was doing this in the online setting. That is a lot harder than realizing when you're walking around the class and interacting with the students. So to summarize, well, as I said, I've got, I had two questions at the beginning of this. The, the first question was, you know, can I build relationships with students? And I really feel from the responses that I got from the students that yes, I could. All right. But, um, and the other question was, can I transfer the pedagogical approaches that I said that I use in the classroom into the online setting? Yes, I could. But at the same time, there were challenges in that in respect to knowing where the students were at and knowing um, how, to, how to challenge them a little bit more. So in saying that, that's the end of my, my talk. Um, do you guys have any questions in respect to any of that that I've, I've just done a lot of talking? So feel free to fire them away. <laughs> I'll, I'll jump in first, I suppose. It's, it's hard enough to build relationships with students that you know, um, let alone as a CRT. Did you feel that you could reach all of the students or was there some students who it was just beyond your grasp, I suppose? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So in respect to connecting with all students. There were some, one, so I had two classes and one class was a year nine class. And I found that over the time, some students just weren't engaging at all. They weren't coming back to the lesson and, and would maybe log in for the first couple of minutes and then leave, um, which, you know, I probably should have chased that up a little bit more in terms of building that relationship to show that I you know, really cared about them. Um, so that was a struggle with some of them, but the ones that obviously, I think the ones that said those things about my teaching were the ones that probably stayed around for the whole time too. So there was, yeah, there's some challenges there with that. So I know a lot of us um, found that students were quite reluctant to turn on their cameras. So from your experience where building the relationships is really important, did you find that you had students turning their cameras on or was this all done with cameras off? It was done with cameras off, <laughs> a lot of it, yeah. <laughs> and but that was one of the things was, I read somewhere, you know, the, the students, they don't, they might not feel comfortable sharing that. And so I think one of the worst things I could do is say, hey, turn your cameras on for that relationship side of things because yeah. they might not feel comfortable. There might be things going on at home. Yeah. There's a whole lot of stuff that they're bringing to that class that, that they wouldn't normally show to other students as well. So I think, yeah, maybe in some ways that added to it. Maybe it didn't, it, mm. it's hard to really know. Yeah. If you could do this all over again, Tom, for those students that didn't feel like they were challenged, how would you do a little bit of differentiation in your classrooms to actually make those students feel like they are being challenged? Yeah, well, I guess it came down to, like I was asking open-ended questions, but I really needed to probably survey them you know, maybe once a week to feel to find out whereabouts they were at and if they were being challenged enough. So I probably would have done surveys a bit more frequently or exit tickets or something a little bit more along those lines to really see where students were at because it's hard to do um, mm -hmm. yeah, in the online setting. So. Yeah, anyway, we'll, we'll move on now um, to that. And thank you for your question. We'll move on now to Michael. Now, Michael, as I mentioned before, is working at Panola Catholic College. He um, is a Gen Z. He's, he's been doing it with a, native, a digital native, really, in second year. So, um, and he's been doing some great things. So, Michael, would you like to go through and share what you have with your experience this year? Thanks, Tom. 
Hi, my name is Michael Schaffner, and today I'm going to share my journey uh, from a second year's perspective, um, and I'm going to call it the youthful experience. So what I want to go through today is uh, four key evaluations, and I'll go through them in quite some detail. So it might seem a little bit obvious, these four, um, to be able to be successful in an online platform, but these are the four that I took away being a second year teacher. So the first is relationships. Second is technology, third is routine, and the fourth is organization. So I wanted to start off with relationships because I believe uh, that's the, the first and foremost um, thing to be able to be really successful online. Um, if you actually take the time to create a relationship with them online, it, is a, it was very much a struggle um, because in the classroom, you do have those opportunities to not talk about the content, but actually get to know the students one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and in this online setting, what I did was pre-class or post-class, I would make some time to be able to have a check-in uh, with one-on-one -on -one students as well as emails and make sure that the, um, the conversations were actually rich and about them, giving them the opportunity to talk about stories that's not related to mathematics. So I believe strongly in creating a, a really, really strong relationship and that will uh, make both our lives, both the students and teachers, uh, much easier. The second thing I want to talk about is technology. And I was very lucky in the era I was born in. I was basically born into technology. Um, so I had the benefit of knowing all of these um, or, or the way they worked and to be able to try and find the best way for these kids to learn. So these six icons here, these are the six I used uh, throughout online learning a lot of Office 365, OneNote, Teams, Schoolbox for the LMS of the school, OBS Studio for recording of videos, and then streaming. Um, and the one thing I want to, um, the one message I want for the older generation is uh, there were a lot of educators that inspired me who actually embraced technology. Uh, so I want to send that message to the older generation. If you continue to use technology and give it a red hot crack, uh, it does inspire the younger educators. So these are some slides uh, of how I use my technology. So the first one here is using OBS and streams and I actually used a flipped classroom approach. You can see Bart Simpson here is obviously <laughs> in the other direction. Um, and so you can see a little um, head of me as well in the video um, that I would post for every single class. Uh, that was to make it a little bit more personal for them and they really appreciated the effort that I put in uh, creating videos and for them to see it prior to formal classes. The second one is an example of how I used OneNote for our personal students who had some questions. So here, my student Jess had a question um, and in about two to three minutes, I could create a very, very quick video of an explanation about it and then give her an opportunity to answer another question and then show me. Here, this is probably giving some um, teachers PTSD, but this was basically uh, one of my classes using Microsoft Teams. Um, and at the very start, Panola did not um, allow cameras to be on. However, we were fortunate enough to be able to have cameras on and to make it that um, little bit more personal. The third, that, the third thing that I found uh, really beneficial was routine. So routine, there were two major groups of students. There were either ghosts, or gurus. So the ghosts were the students that found it really, really difficult online uh, and just shied away from coming onto online. And then we had the gurus who so actually adapted really, really well. Uh, and I'm quite proud of those students to be able to be that adaptable. And what I found that helped um, to be a really good approach for those ghost students uh, was to have a very supportive outlook. So for those that weren't online as much as I, I needed them to, uh, a quick email to start off with saying, hey, I'm just wondering um, how you're going. I just want to have a chat with you um, and then go from there. They really, really appreciated understanding and um, allowing them to voice their opinion on how they're going. Um, and when you show that investment and care, they are more likely to be able to turn from a ghost and more to uh, a guru online. And the last thing here is organisation. So I'm just going to show you quickly uh, what the students saw on a weekly basis. So here is a weekly task list that I would um, drop on Schoolbox, the LMS. Um, and they appreciated that weekly task list because the ones that were gurus could manage their time really well. Uh, and those ghosts knew exactly 
uh, what was coming up. So everything that you see here on the screen, whether it be the Teams or Desmos or the OneNote or the actual questions or how they submit, everything there was linked or hyperlinked. So they could simply click and then use their time wisely. Another thing with organization is with being educators, a lot of you would know that being a role model uh, is crucial. So the more that you are organized, the more that the uh, student would be. And I know with online learning, time was never our friend, uh, but to be able to do that behind the scenes work, be really, really organized and showcase your organization online, uh, that would mirror in the student's behaviors. So to sum up, what was learnt? So the very first thing is relationships are first and foremost. And showing that care and interest and investing your time in creating relationships um, over content is really, really crucial. The second is technology and just to try and try and fail, try and fail. Keep repeating that um, until you find what works for you. And for those older generations, continue to inspire the young generation. With routine, for me, there were uh, two groups, ghosts and gurus. And for me, the approach that worked to get more gurus than ghosts was a supportive approach. And the last one was organization. Time is not our friend. However, to be really, really time efficient and organized gives the opportunity for you to role model what you expect from the students. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Wow. Can I, <laughs> so second year, you're going through and you're, you're doing all of these things and you've been thrown into the, you know, and this is your first year teaching in Australia as well. I'm looking at that and there's a lot there. How did you cope with all of the time and effort that went into that? Thanks, Tom. So there was a lot of behind the scenes work. Uh, I sort of had to really, really use my time wisely in making a decision. So I think the hardest thing was making a decision, what platforms am I going to use? What pl platforms won't I use? Um, and it was sort of by the end of it, I was really, really confident with what I was going to use. So that trial and error process, it was very, very tight. But I think just making that, um, that time to be able to explore some of the platforms and say, right, this is how I'm going to use it and then tweak it from there. That was probably, it was tough, but it was beneficial. Um, I'll, I'll jump in, sorry, okay. Lisa. But right. um, I found making videos very tough and I was having conniptions every time I would make a mistake. So I'm interested to know what your process was, what um, technology you used. And as a second part, how did you check the viewing figures in a flipped classroom? Sure, great question, Nick. So what I did was I used OBS Studio and Streams to create those videos. And uh, I had many, many takes, like you said, but what worked for me is making one large recording and then snipping as I went um, and to make those videos less than six minutes long. If they were any longer, I reckon I would lose about half my students. In order to check if they've actually watched the videos, um, with my platform, I couldn't actually see who viewed it. I could see the views. However, let's say there were 30 views. What I got the students to do was just write a little comment on the bottom saying completed, and then I could see their name. So it was a little bit of tweaking. I didn't have that from the start, um, but it was, um, it was beneficial to use that, that comment section. I'm really interested in exploring a bit more about the idea of ghosts. And I love how you've actually come up with that name for the students that did struggle to engage online. With that personalised approach and support and, and care, did you still find that there were some students that remained ghosts and you just weren't able to get them to re-engage with their learning? Thanks, Lisa. So there were definitely ghosts by the end of it. Um, however, there was some sort of positive growth in them, yeah. whether it be minute. However, there was some sort of uh, positive growth. So that supportive approach was the best for those students that sort of turned a blind eye and wasn't online. Um, so just being on their side and giving them the opportunity to voice what's happening with them, uh, I found it really, really beneficial. Yeah. And how have they re-engaged now that we're back at school face to face? Oh, they are so much more appreciative of being in the classroom. <laughs> I didn't expect them to be actually saying, oh my God, I love being in the classroom now. Um, so it's actually very re refreshing to be back and seeing them as well. We go. Thank you, Michael. I tell you what. What I certainly got from that was the calls to the parents to say, "Hey, you know, let, yeah, let's let's get these kids back engaged and, and things like that." And, and the focus on growth, irrespective of you know if it was little, if it was lots, if it didn't matter. It was you saw positives in every single student, which I think is absolutely brilliant. So thank you for sharing your experiences. Mm -hmm.
for sure. So now we're going to um, pass over to Lisa, but before we do that, just remember if you do have any questions at all in today's, um, whilst watching any one of the presenters today, please put them into the chat or into the, into the class and the questions because I will come back to those and we will answer them towards the end of the session. Now, Lisa has, she's the head of mathematics at, uh, at Over Newton uh, Secondary College in Keewal. And she's, she's juggling being head of mathematics, being a teacher full time, obviously, and also a mum of a six year old with ADHD. So you, I could imagine it'd be pretty hectic <laughs> being at home trying to juggle all those things. Now, Lisa said, though, that the, there is, it's all possible. You can have it all. You can have a great time and have it all um, as long as you've got a great team, a great partner and a glass of wine. So I can't wait to hear what, what Lisa's got to share with us today. Lisa, take it away. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So Lisa Haranis from Over Newton College in Keelor. Um, I'm going to tell you my story. So it was mid-March and Monday morning, and I'm in the photocopy room getting ready for the week ahead. And my boss, who's the college head of pedagogy, walked in, and she had just returned from a weekend away with the leadership team at their annual board retreat. And she quietly said to me, Lisa, we need to prepare for the fact that schools may have to close. And I laughed because at the time I just thought that that was so ridiculous. And I suppose little did I know that we would end up having to take our teaching online twice throughout this year. So as we approach the end of term one, it was a really uncertain time. And I'm someone that prides themselves on being super organized. And I love to be able to foresee any possible issues and to be able to come up with lots of different plans to work around those. And at this point in time, that was near impossible. So I was running into overdrive thinking, how are we going to make sure that as a faculty, our students can engage in quality mathematics education? And at this point in time, it's near the end of term one, we've got all this uncertainty around us and the decision was made to trial some online learning platforms. So our year 12 students were able to use Skype and they in fact were the only students that would have access to the online video conferencing. The rest of the students from prep right through to year 11 would only be able to access video content using our learning management system style, which is brilliant by the way, and has lots of great um, features. So this was really difficult because without that interaction, I kept thinking, how were our students going to be able to, you know, ask questions and, you know, other than in a forum where it was just in a, in a chat or a discussion board, um, how would we as teachers be able to respond to the needs of our students by gauging body language and their facial expressions and, and using some questioning techniques. So it was all really, you know, quite overwhelming. For the start of term two, when we really had to delve into a formal learning from home period, we were really thankful as a group of staff that we were able to introduce Microsoft Teams. And so Teams then gave us as teachers the ability to have the live video conferencing with our students. Now, with using Teams, that was a, you know, a brilliant, brilliant um, tool. And I was also able to, as a head of faculty, really trial using some other tools that, um, with that, such as OneNote, uh, an iPad, and of course, my trusty Apple Pencil, which I would not have been able to get through this year without. So for me personally, I found that this point in time was really difficult as a leader. So the leaders above me were having to make swift decisions and there was no time for collaboration. And I understood that it needed to be like this, but I really wasn't used to this way of working. I'm someone who loves to be able to bounce around ideas, not just with my maths team, but with other heads of faculty and other people in leadership positions and be able to really talk through and arrive at a decision together. Um, and, and this just wasn't the case at this point in time. So there was all this chaos going on behind the scenes and I was really feeling quite overwhelmed. Um, you know, I was needing to obviously set, manage my faculty. I was having to teach my own classes. I had two year 12 classes and a year eight class and also deal with the fact that I, I'm a full-time working mother with a child with ADHD. You know, you'd hear him running down the hallway on his scooter board whilst he was having a movement break. I had to make sure though, that throughout this time, my students and my staff could not see how stressed I was and how much I was really personally struggling. 
So I'm quite thankful today to even hear that my staff said that they didn't really know how much I was struggling. And so I think there was some advantages to not being at school. I do not have a very good poker face. The, everyone can always tell what I'm thinking. Um, so maybe not being able to see me was a, was a good thing. I'm really also quite thankful of the fact that I've been able to develop some strong ICT skills. And so I used the learning from home period to be able to explore and investigate different strategies and different tools that would be able to work. And so what I found was that my head of faculty role really shifted into becoming the number one tech support for my staff. So lots of time was spent on calls with my team, looking at improving their efficiency um, with you know, the admin tasks that go with teaching, with being able to promptly follow up um, feedback and, and work from, from students, but also to really make the most of the 15 minute live video calls that we needed to uh, provide to our students. And so, you know, I was reflecting with the, the panel before about how, you know, at the start of the learning from home period, I had some members of my team actually go to Officeworks and purchase a giant whiteboard and they would have that behind them whilst teaching to the camera. Uh, and by the time we started the second learning from home period, we had them then no longer utilising those whiteboards, but they, like me, were making the most of their iPad and Apple Pencil. And I tell you, this Apple Pencil has been so useful and I think that Apple need to give me some, uh, some funds because I know of at least 10 staff that have gone out and purchased one based on the advice that I had actually given them. Now, I've talked a little bit about how staff needed to be efficient um, and the importance of providing timely feedback to our students. So whilst we know that this is really important, this was probably the thing that the staff struggled with the most. Um, there really seemed to be, particularly in learning from home in the first time round, we call it 1.0 at my school, um, we said that there was just really no work-life balance. The work-life balance was non-existent and staff were spending so much time creating additional video content to help students in additional one-on-one -on -one calls providing assistance, but also having to chase up the ghosts, as Michael called them, those students that just were not engaging and trying to find ways of being able to get those students uh, involved or to be able to get them to do some, some type of work so that they weren't then developing gaps in their learning. The other part of feedback that we were receiving as leaders was that our students were really struggling. They were struggling to keep up with the workload. And so the message from our leaders was that we needed to slow down. And we understood that this was, you know, obviously really important for the well-being of our students. And it was fairly easy to do in our younger years. Um, but I know as teachers of VCE, we found that really quite challenging because at the end of the day, our study designs for 2021 haven't undergone any adjustments. And so we still needed to make sure we were building up a solid foundation, particularly for our year 11 students. So in order to be able to slow down and help manage the staff workload, one of the strategies that I suggested and asked my team to implement was to introduce an offline lesson once a week. And this was to give the staff some time to be able to follow up on students, but also for our students to have a catch up lesson and to consolidate. The teacher would still be available to offer any assistance, but there would be no new content introduced and no online uh, learning. So that was really quite successful. One of the things that I don't think was quite successful early on was assessment. And I could talk forever about the frustrations and difficulties with trying to authentically assess online. Um, we made the decision that our year 10, 11 and 12 students would still need to perform, uh, do their assessments um, during learning from home. And there were all sorts of um, issues that we encountered. But the one story that I do want to share with you is it's term three. By this stage, we've introduced Zoom to be able to supervise our students completing their assessments. And it's time for both the methods and specialist problem solving tasks. We wanted to make sure that our students were able to print out the SAC and to be able to handwrite. And we thought it was really important for there to be that level of consistency for all students. Now, some of our students, unfortunately, did not have access to a printer. 
So our solution was to look at which staff members lived within their five kilometre radius. They would then go and hand deliver the sack in a sealed envelope to the student's household. And as the sack started, they would proceed to open the envelope on camera for their teacher. And so that was one of the, I suppose, funny stories that we uh, encountered. Now, 2020 has delivered many gifts, and I'm not just talking about the wonderful Brett Sutton or Alan Cheng talking about mathematical modelling at press conferences. There is so much data for us that we are now going to be able to use with our students, real, authentic, meaningful data. And I'm really looking forward to being able to explore how we can um, incorporate that into our lessons, not just at VCE level, but through our junior years as well into the future. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Lisa. Do you guys have any questions for Lisa? I mean, I've got plenty, but we'll come to them at the end for me. But do you guys have anything that you want to ask right now? Oh, I'm just interested in what the major concern was from your staff. Like, you've got a different perspective for all of us here. Yeah. Um, what was the major thing they would come to you with? Um, probably being able to... Uh, one of the things that they found really difficult was our students would have to scan and upload their work onto Style, which is our learning management system. And then they weren't sort of able to work out how to download that and be able to market and get it back to the students in a timely fashion. So I was sort of having to help them yeah. with just little little things like that. Technology. Yeah, the, <laughs> the technology. But it was also just constantly making sure, like checking that students were actually completing the work and then that, that follow-up approach and having to email parents or contact students. And that was, it was relentless. Like it was just never ending. <laughs> no, we know. Yeah. <laughs> I have a question about the use the words timely feedback and I yeah. think that's so crucial to be able to give them feedback uh, in a really, really quick manner. Yeah. So what was the process of actually getting that feedback back to them? Yeah, so the students, the, the structure of our lessons that we had set up on style, um, you know, included learning intention, success criteria, there would be additional video content, we would set work for the students and then we would have a section where they needed to upload evidence of their learning and ask questions and so you needed to make sure that if the students were actually going to use that that you if they asked a question you needed to be able to get back to them within 20 a 24 hour period mm. otherwise what was the point of having that section there and for some people that worked really well and for others you know not so much and we found that for the ones that it didn't work very well for it's because they just weren't able to keep up to be able to keep up with that. And so then they use other, other strategies to help the students. Um, but for the staff where that was most you know, successful, it was about really making sure that they were getting back to those, those kids really, really quickly. Mm. Yeah. Very interesting. Mm. Thank you and thank you, Lisa. All right, so now we have our last panel member for today who's about to present. Uh, now, Nick's, Nick's come from uh, Trinity Grammar in Q, an all boys school. And it's, Nick's experience is quite different, once again, to ours. Essentially, they were told that with a day's notice, we're going to be going online. Fortunately for them, they had all the platforms ready to go. And so it, they had one day to get it all happening. And then it was business as usual. That is, nothing changed other than the fact that they were teaching online. So, Nick, uh, please take it away. Tell us about your story. Yeah, well, business as usual. I suppose I should explain what that is. Um, that means full timetable, full length lessons, full attendance, roles taken, full assessment and reporting. So the only thing that slightly changed was year seven classes went down five minutes and they were asked not to give homework, although inevitably, as you find out, they sometimes had to complete some. Now the maths faculty has a really highly prescribed work schedule down to individual lessons. Um, so we knew that every lesson would involve some sort of retrieval starter, um, teaching new content, um, questioning and student practice time. We didn't mandate cameras. Um, some students liked having them on, but we did find that we would see things that we perhaps didn't want to see. So I remember seeing a mother making a bed behind a student, which was interesting. Some student forgot to turn his camera off when he went to the toilet. And I also had a cunning student who, uh, he used a still frame as a profile picture of him looking down the camera. And it took me about half an hour to realize that he wasn't actually live on video. He was just got a fake profile picture there. So they were pretty cunning, but we didn't mandate it. Um, one of the things that a lot of staff and a lot of teachers find difficult is preparation of lessons. And for us, that's actually fairly systematic because of the way that our work schedule works, where we use similar worked examples and modeling, and we have this rhythm um, to our maths uh, that works through. So culturally, we know that we'll present the material and the boys 
while they can ask questions at the time, obviously it is expected at some point they will um, come back to it for their own learning. So they've got to seek out assistance outside of class as well. The hardest thing for us was assessment and feedback. Um, because we were maintaining our work schedule, we maintained all assessment in place for year seven to 10 through the whole of the distance learning. This meant four assessments per topic. Each topic lasted about two to three uh, weeks. Um, that was a quiz, a learning analysis task, um, a workbook check, and also their topic test. That means that we mark, we do 40 marks that are recorded into their mark book at the end of the year. Um, any pen stroke effectively that they do is assessed. So that wasn't also including the fact that we were doing continuous reporting comments for year eight and 11 after each topic. So that was expected to be in for this, the parents to see. Um, if we're gonna run this much assessment, how are we gonna run the assessments? Like Lisa was talking about, I suppose we used a mixture of OneNote, uh, Microsoft Forms and scanned PDFs. Um, my main, main issue was that marking took two to three times longer uh, than usual, because you're obviously flicking through different pages. You are um, often dealing with really dodgy scans. So, um, and I, I remember seeing a lot of boys laps because they seemed to like to take photos on their laps. So you would often see a lot of their legs. Um, I got a bit sick of it. So what I did was I, um, I made these uh, things called rocket books, which I've got here as an example. They have a QR code in the corner um, and I got the boys to come into school and pick them up and the boys could then, um, it's much easier to scan up an image with high fidelity that they could upload to their OneNote with their workbook. Um, the integrity of our assessments obviously maybe suffered a little bit. You could start categorize that some of the B pluses might've been C pluses, um, but we thought that with the um, expectation of that assessment and the expectation of that performance, that learning would continue and they would be better off for it in the long run. So I suppose at this point you're wondering what's the impact on us as staff and also as the students. I suppose as staff, you've got to think that we're already used to these demands. So we have this works, this assessment cycle in place. Um, on top of that, we don't have uh, sports. So I would have been taking um, football training twice a week, coming home about 5.30 or 6, games on a Saturday. So that's wiped out for the distance learning. So no problem for me. Didn't have all the other things you might have to attend, like house activities or presentation nights or whatever things pop up. So I did feel frustrated, but it was usually with the fact that technology was difficult to use rather than the actual workload. Um, the students themselves, obviously, they found it difficult as well. Um, but we put this sort of rhythm of assessment and structure of teaching in from year seven. So they know what the rhythm is. They, they have a, a habit that, okay, that assessment's coming up, then the quiz will come up, then the task will come up. So it's pretty used to it. And also they, they didn't have all the other extra curricular activities that they normally would have. So school sport is compulsory. They didn't have that. They didn't have their club sports, music, drama. They didn't have all of this. And a lot of students just found that they were able to focus in on what they were doing during the lessons um, and get most of their work done during the lessons. So we didn't actually have a whole lot of homework. Um, there was obviously the ghosts, there was the gurus, and you could feel a bit of the apathy and let lethargy, but the boys were expected to answer questions. So if they didn't answer a question, if I asked and cold called them, uh, if I thought that they weren't in the lesson, I would just call a parent mid-lesson because you're on Microsoft Teams, so it's no drama for me, and I would just find out where they were. Um, the parents were very pleased that the boys were there from 8.30 to 3.30. They knew they were gonna be um, at their screen or they were, at lunchtime they were asked to go outside or during sport. But effectively, um, I found actually they were more accessible to me for pastoral issues. Uh, I suppose at the end of the day, it, it seems like maybe we're all work and no play and that might make Jack a dull boy, as they say. But I actually thought that the intensity of the online program meant that all day I'm having heightened interactions with the boys so it strengthened some of my relationships with, especially my year 10 class. Uh, they got very used to seeing my six month old who'd have to come and sit on my lap sometimes. Um, his name's Theo. They asked me if that was short for theoretical probability, uh, which it wasn't. But they, uh, look, I think that I lost a year eight class. I feel like that relationship is gone a little bit towards the end of the year. Um, it might be a manner in which that, that year level, you're normally doing a lot of maturing and they didn't get to do it through the programs we have at school. The program was intense, a bit lonely, a bit frustrating, but it showed how resilient I think the students and staff at Trinity were, and I was really proud of um, how, we, how we progressed through the distance learning. Thanks. Thank you, Nick. Wow, there's, I mean, there's so <laughs> many, because that's such a different experience to what I had in terms of, I was able to go through and, and 
do what I wanted essentially with the students. Whereas you said, you know, it, with the curriculum you've got, it's very prescriptive. You've got to teach in a certain way at a certain time. How do you find balancing the, the prescriptive nature? Like, what do you think it worked having that? Or do you feel like the, you lose creativity in terms of being able to choose that? How do you find navigating that? I suppose that we are a school that does a lot of explicit instruction. And so we, we get a lot of emphasis on modeling and work examples, and that's the solutions. Perhaps we're a bit overly skills-based, you could argue that. And that means that we do so much new content regularly that there is a conceptual understanding which might go to the wayside a little bit, but because we loop back around on it in our curriculums, we tend to get the boys there where we need them to be. Uh, yes, I think it is a real challenge about getting that open-ended you know, exploration of ideas when we just need to keep, keep the learning going, keep the um, performance and achievement at that level. I don't know if I've got the balance right yet, but that's just <laughs> me as a teacher as well. <laughs> yeah. I have a question for Nick, um, just about mental health. Now, when you when you talk about just focusing on the academia side, without your music, drama, presentations, house sports, uh, I was curious to know: were there any students that felt like it was just too much, or even for yourself? I know that the culture of the school um, and the habits are built into them really young, but I'm curious to know: were there any that really, really struggled or yourself at points? Yeah. Look, I have a Year Seven form. And that especially, you're, you're, as a pastoral responsibility, you've got these boys trying to make friends who have no opportunity for it as soon as your term two comes in. I felt I was in constant communication with the um, year seven parents. Mm. Because of the nature of you being in front of a screen, you're not being whisked away all the time. You could call them a lot. So I felt I'd talk to them a lot more. The boys who were struggling, I was probably in contact with their parents weekly with a regular catch up. But to be honest, most of them, honestly, they felt like they had an ample amount of time to get through the material, whether or not they felt like they were struggling with maths and other personal responsibilities. If they needed time off, I just said, take the day. There was no drama about that. So I know that we sound very rigid, but it's not a problem for that to do that. And um, I, th I think we'll probably find out in the future a little bit more about whether or not the impacts of what we, what we did <laughs> we'll find out a little bit more if they, if the learning was there, if they have got those relationships built that they need to and the pastoral things. So look, as I said, we went one way, some schools went the other way. I know that your experiences are very different. The year eight. So I'm interested to know, cause I have a year eight class yeah. as well. And I feel like they've probably were the ones that struggled the most to engage um, and probably yeah, were impacted the most in comparison to my year. 12s, have you still struggled to en engage them and build the relationship with them since returning to school? Yeah, I felt like I, I don't want to say lost them, but mm. I didn't have the routines in place. Mm. And they're the most likely, you know, they've hit your eight, they have realised that they can question authority, yeah. they realise they can get away <laughs> with things, and they normally would have a, what we call learning journeys at our school, so they go around for way for a camp where they yeah. confront each other a little bit, mm. <laughs> and we didn't have that program in place. Yeah. Uh, I, I found them... Yeah, I, I don't think it. I would want to do that again with that age group. Mm. Year seven was still keen. Year yeah. ten seemed mature enough. They want to have a bit of fun. Yeah. Year twelve as well. I had a year twelve. They were probably the most despondent that I had. Yeah. Because their whole year has been ruined. They're just focusing on work and. Mm. Um, I yeah, I'm I'm a bit concerned. I don't think that I have the year eights anymore. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> really interesting. It's yeah. been really interesting. It's I know there were a lot of conversations about um, from some of us that felt and obviously we had the VCE students come back first and that's the way that it had to you know had to be but I think those those real you know middle years eight nines and tens being the last ones to return and they probably were the year levels that we I think they really struggled the most um, is yeah really really interesting so I think yeah strong structure and routine is going to be paramount for those students next year yeah. absolutely absolutely well, it's now come to that stage of the, of the panel discussion where we'll answer some of your questions. Now, just as I'm looking through, I can see people have been putting the questions in the chat. The challenge with that is as every, every time someone writes, it then takes me straight back down to the bottom of the chat. So I can't see the questions. There is a button down just below that where you can see it says, ask a question. So if you do have a question or if you have put a question in the chat at all and you feel like it still hasn't been answered, please click on that button, the ask a question button and, and that way it'll be able to pop up on my screen. I can make sure that we actually get to answer your questions here as well. 
Whilst we wait for that, I, I did have a question that I wanted to circle back to with um, you, Lisa. Yeah. You, you spoke about, you know, you're, you're the head of faculty and then you've got all these other things going on and I'm thinking about you managing your faculties as you're doing that. Like, how are you keeping sane? Um, and, and how you, with your team, I think being in a leadership position, I think being, in, especially in middle management, you're, you're teaching and also you're trying to manage yeah. a team and, and, and manage the directions from above as well. Mm. How did you support your staff? So I guess there's two parts. How did you look after yourself? First of all, wine. Then, yeah, wine. <laughs> yeah, that's you said that. <laughs> yep, so wine helps. And then, and then how did you look up, uh, look after your staff? How did you support their yeah. mental health and, 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 and that sort of thing? Yeah, I think, um, you know, with being able to support my staff, I first of all needed to be able to relate to some of the issues that they were experiencing. And so having the three, you know, classes um, was you know, really important um, because I was able to, you know, experience some of the same, you know, issues that they that they had. Um, I think for for me, I love to be an ear. You know, I want to be someone that that they can come to come and talk talk to. Um, and so, yeah, there were lots of Lisa. Can I pick your brain for a minute? Particularly with my senior faculty, um, there was a lot of a lot of that um, going on where we, you know, jump on a team's call. The calls would always go a lot longer than what they needed to as we shared some, you know, hilarious stories of things that, you know, that were happening um, with the learning, learning from home. But it was just about listening, you know, to them, trying to be really positive as, as well, I think is really, really important. Um, and so, you know, letting, letting staff, I suppose, vent but also trying to make sure that the mindset is really positive is um, important. So, yeah, just making sure that I would, had the time for the staff when they needed me, I think was, yeah. Right. So it sounds like it's wine, yeah. listen and laugh. So have a laugh with this staff yeah. about, yes. you know, some of the absolutely. things. absolutely. And then I suppose, you know, when you're dealing with other things, you don't cry in front of, in front of your staff. I had a, <laughs> a, a few other staff members, other co-heads of faculty, I think that I was able to turn to to cry. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, we do have a couple of questions now starting to come through. First of all, I have um, from Andrew Burden. Uh, Michael, what editing and streaming software did you use? I found using QuickTime and YouTube quite cumbersome with upload times and would appreciate some pointers on how you use streaming. Sure. So I used OBS Studio to actually uh, record my videos. Um, it gave me the opportunity just to show what was on my desktop as well as keeping a little head of me in one of the bottom corners um, and I felt like it worked really really well I just needed to watch a quick tutorial on how to use OBS um, and then I could start recording like Nick asked I basically recorded uh, a whole take so I didn't start and stop start and stop so if I needed to uh, cut things I just simply used what was on my computer to finalize that and then I made sure that it was about less than six minutes long uh, one concept per video and then because our school is an Office 365 school, I would upload that onto Microsoft Streams and then the students could see it from Microsoft Streams. And just quickly, you were using OneNote. You were writing directly onto like a pre-prepared OneNote or maybe a plain OneNote. So it was a class notebook, OneNote. Yeah. Um, so the kids could actually see those lesson notes as well. So they could see the video as it goes on and then make reference to that OneNote as well. Did we think that OneNote was the of use in the end or yeah I think I believe so a lot of us used yeah. it and we're very um yeah, we found some it people still wanted yeah. to use PowerPoint um and some people were using the whiteboards yeah. behind the another really popular one with my stuff was explain everything which is the okay. iPad app um and and that was really good for creating videos um the reason why I personally used OneNote though was because I needed to also screen share the Casio class pad emulator particularly at year 12 mm. so you're doing um, quick time recordings yes. with the emulator and OneNote yeah on the screen yeah I was probably a little bit different again I used a document camera mm. and wrote all my uh notes live on the document with the document camera mm. um so uh yeah <laughs> bit of a challenge and I use PowerPoint and, and a collaborative whiteboard. So it was, yeah, 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 there we go. it was very different approaches. Um, I, think, I think rather than getting stuck into one though, mm. it's fine what works for the specific thing that you want to teach. Mm. Think about what it is, what outcomes do you want from it? What do you want the students to be able to do? And then use the technology second to support rather than having the technology drive. Mm. Correct. Yeah. yeah, I agree with that. Yep, excellent. 
Right, at the next question um, that I've got is, how worried are we about um, for the engagement of the current year eight and year nine going into 2021? Do you have any plans to address missed learning? This is from Paul McGlynn. Uh, Lisa, you're ahead of- Yeah, so, <laughs> I mean, obviously um, we have sort of, I think one of the things, if I think about specifically our year eight and year nine students, term three, we usually teach equations and linear graphs. And we all made the decision that that would be a nightmare having to do that online. So we sort of flipped that and pushed that back into term four. And I'm still not 100% sure of the effectiveness of that because the engagement levels, the students are really um, tired. So we are going to need to make sure, and we've you know sort of talked about you know making sure that we do like an academic handover um, for our students mathematically to ensure that the teachers of the following year are well aware of some of, as a cohort, what might be some of the, the gaps in learning, um, but also individually for each of the students. And, you know, we use um, essential assessment as a diagnostic assessment tool. So that will be really useful in being able to pass on that information from our year eight to our year nine staff. And we've got, yeah, um, similar um, pre-testing that we'll be doing from that. I think it's really going to be a matter of continuing that pre-testing though next year to really start to uncover whether there are um, any gaps and to then look at how we are going to be able to manage that moving forward. Like we have assumptions at the moment, but until we get more data on hand, we can't really, I suppose, plan for that yet. Well, yeah, business as usual. Yeah, probably, I don't know where. <laughs> I'm course coordinating year eight maths next year. So I will have a look at it. There are certain topics that were better to teach online because mm. the nature of what you could do with um, technology mm. so we'll have a look at that and and whether we need to amend the pace mm. of it or certain reteach certain things that we'll look at that so difficult do you have anything no they were both great answers <laughs> awesome yeah i think i think with respect to me and, and the engagement moving forwards and, and obviously there is a real concern that some students have fallen behind yeah. you know the department has put in money to, yep. to have tutoring happening um, next year. I'm pretty sure it's at the, just at the department yeah, right. school, yeah. which I think is really, really good. But at the same time, we need to be careful in terms of how that money is used. I, mm. I really think that, um, you know, if we're just saying, all right, we'll put a couple of tutors in the classroom or, or maybe we'll just, you know, have, have kids come and you ask them questions, oh, how are you going, where are you at? I don't think that would be great no. use of the thing. I think it really needs to be a structure, a, a proper structure moving forwards where there's, there's a bit of a team of tutors and someone heading it up mm. and, and using an assessment, whether it be the a scaffolding numeracy in the middle years or something else like that, yeah. that has a structure that you can then grab the assessment, find out where the students are at and then really use that to address where they're at and then help you moving forwards as yeah. well. I think that that's response a, to intervention um, it, approach. Yeah, it really yeah. needs to be quite strong and, and, yeah. and structured in terms of how we do it. Otherwise, mm. it, it could be you know, a potential waste of, of yeah. those resources. So I think it's great, but at the same time, there mm. are some things that yeah, need to think about. Um, okay, another question is, uh, did you have any trouble authenticating student assessments, seeing they were doing them at home? <laughs> Bernadette Mercisha, it might be. I'm sorry if I've pronounced that correctly. Uh, okay, I think I've got one. a laugh coming from Lisa. Lisa, can you answer that one for us? Um, yeah, we certainly did. Um, so during the first learning from home period, we had, we were, look, we were really lucky. Our year 12s were able to do all of their assessment um, at the same time, which, you know, for a subject like further maths is really important. We have five classes, close to 120 students doing it. Um, we didn't have that in place the first time around. So we were only assessing year 10, 11 and 12 at, um, at Over Newton. Um, year 11s, um, we discovered, we were alerted by a parent that there were screenshots of a um, recursion and financial modelling assessment that was floating around. And that was right before the return to school. So we had the entire year 11 cohort um, have to come in on a Wednesday, stay behind on a Wednesday afternoon and do another assessment um, because we just weren't able to authenticate it. Um, so that, yeah, we certainly, uh, we knew that there was an issue and that's why when we had to go into learning from home the second time for term three, um, as a, like a senior academic team, we sat down and said, if we're going to do this, we need to make sure that the students are all doing it at the same time and that they're being supervised. And so we were able to use Zoom the second time 
round and we didn't seem to have any major issues um, that time, which worked, yeah, it worked really well. Mm. I guess, um, Nick, <laughs> with your assessment, you had four different assessment things yeah. going on. So you, it wasn't just a summative. Focus okay, for so with, we would sometimes give them, there'd be two versions of the quiz or test going around and that have just slightly different values. Yeah. So that sometimes gave it away if you were getting something that someone else picked up. Usually I have a timer going as well. So there would be some time constraints. So if you wanted to cheat, we'd try to press it so that the mm. time constraints meant that even if you were gonna do that, you wouldn't be able to do it in time. Um, Microsoft Forms obviously can jumble the questions so you can have them in different order and they're multiple choice. So it's not so easy as like, what's the answer for number two? I acknowledge that there was cheating going on, we'll call it, helping, we'll call it helping. helping. <laughs> Um, and the integrity is down. I, you would ideally like, we had the microphones on. Um, ideally, you would like to have uh, a locked, like you do at a university, I think sometimes for assessments, like a locked platform that lock, that you can't go and click into other um, mm -hmm. things once you're into it. I don't know if anyone's designing that for potential next year if, that, if we go into this situation again, but that would be something I think that a maths, uh, especially math stuff, because mm -hmm. of the way we do assessment is all handwritten, right? Mm -hmm. Um, compared to some other subjects who can do Word documents. Yeah. So if someone wants to build that software and provide it to schools, I think that that would be, yeah, that's, that would be a winner, especially for us. Mm. <laughs> Adam, are you oh, I might add, I had a very similar situation as, as you, Nick. Uh, I, I use Microsoft Forms to start off with, yep. um, and I found it really, really great just to be able to see, just firstly, marking the multiple choice, yep. you, know, you can get that answer right, and then looking at the short answer from there. Um, however, by the end of it, I decided, oh, we decided to change forms just to be able to have them print off the work or print off the test. So give them printing time. Um, if they didn't have a printer like some of your students, Lisa, um, they would have it on their screen. However, they weren't allowed to use their computer. So when their camera was facing them, they weren't allowed to access the computer merely just to maybe scroll, yeah. but it needed to be minimal. So on their camera, what it, we need to see was basically just heads down, add a piece of paper. Show us your hands. That's right. Yeah. Sort, sort of make sure that you're not doing anything dodgy. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, there was only a couple of times where there were technical issues where yeah. the camera would turn off. Um, but in saying that, it's very, very hard to authenticate work. Yeah. To do that consistently, like, you know, the amount of assessment we were doing, to consistently be like, everyone camera's on, mic's on all the time mm. is tricky. So sometimes with the you would the lower level assessments, so the more check for understanding assessments. Mm. It would just be quickly get it back to me in 15 minutes. Mm. You've got this much time. Yeah, I think, and that, that when, you thought, when you talk about the check for understanding assessments, that sort of is what's coming to me through thinking about this and how assessments been used in, on, in the online mm. world. My, I guess my thinking around it is, you know, what is the purpose of the assessments that we're doing? Are we, are we doing it about performance? Is that what the, because the students are cheating for the idea of yeah. performance, they yeah. go, oh, well, I want to do well. But yeah. but really, I mean, that's a, maybe that's an opportunity for us to question some of the assessment that we do mm. moving forwards and think yeah. about, is it for performance or is it about helping students to grow and find out where they're at so we can then progress from there? Yeah. Um, it's a big question, probably one that we don't have time to answer <laughs> yeah. today, but maybe You're that's right, something to so. think about. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, all right. There is another question, um, and, and I love these things, rocket books. We, we've had a question yes. from Lillian uh, Zambicelli. So if you wouldn't mind, Nick, you've I got your rocket book. I can possibly put it underneath here if we work out which way this goes. Um, yeah. This is a student one. Is it coming up underneath there? Which yeah. way do you want? This way? Okay, so um, this is a student's one I gave to them. As you can see in the corner, we have the QR code. Um, you can download these for free, these sheets, and I just bound them together. Um, effectively, you can then preset where they're going to be sent to. So you can anywhere here, check the box. Um, the students can work down it as they did. And it just does a really nice high fidelity scan compared to some of the other things that I use, like lens and photos and things. So as you can see here, we just look through the book. Um, and that's another way of checking for understanding or checking that they're using the solutions to the same rigor, rigorous level that you're expecting. Um, there's an official rocket book that you can buy. I don't use that so much. Um, because uh, it just wasn't useful for what we were doing there. So you can actually get that for free. I would recommend if you ever want your students to go into the situation again, give it to them. They can easily upload it to you at home. So 
Yeah, because the actual rocket books themselves, yeah. you can you can write on them, and then you can just get a, a piece of like a, a wet cloth and wipe it off, and then so it's a it's an everlasting book. Yeah, it's which, a fr you use a friction pen and you wipe it off, and it just never ends, and you can just quickly upload it whatever you've written. It's good for travel, so if you're someone who journals and writes things, but um, yeah, I thought that I found that app just before distance learning came, and it was excellent. It was outstanding. I loved it, and it dates it as well. So for those students who are constantly like flipping between pages and never writing things in order it, it sorts it out in yeah. dates as well so yeah and you can also get them little beacons for for whiteboards as well so that you can scan your whiteboard and it turns it into a pdf too which is pretty cool yeah. um all right well it's now probably time to wrap things up i guess first of all what i'd like to say is a huge thank you to to all the three of you i know there's been a lot of time put in behind the scenes in, in terms of putting this together um so Michael, Lisa, and Nick, thank you very much for your time. I'm not sure the people at home are, are appreciating this too. Um, the, I guess to wrap it up for me, it, it really, you know, this year was unlike any other. We, the, the topic of today's conversation is what did we learn? Well, the question probably that would be easy to ask is what didn't we learn? <laughs> I think for as a profession, it's probably been one of the biggest years of growth that we have seen and that we may see again for quite some time in terms of the challenges that we've faced and, and doing that. But but at the same time, it's been exciting. It really has to, to listen to the, the brilliant people next to me, but also the teachers in, in the schools that I work at and, and the, that I have conversations with about just how open people have been to learning. So I think that's, that's what I've taken away from it is, you know, teaching, it's a resilient occupation. We keep bouncing back, we keep doing, and we keep striving to improve. So um, yeah, thank you for, for tuning in today. Before you do go, there are a couple of things. Uh, there is a virtual satchel that you can check out on the Delegates Connect platform. Go and check that out um, when this is finished. Another thing is make sure you check out the sponsors and, um, and the ex exhibition uh, online section as well. There's a whole range of things that you might be able to find there that work really well for you and your school. So go and get the, um, check that out when you get the chance. The next session will be at 10.25. So you've got a little bit of time to go and do that now. Go grab a cuppa, whatever you like, maybe change your moccasins for some shoes, whatever you want. Um, and thank you again for tuning in. See you next time.